From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. An audit of the Arizona Department of Revenue's IT system shows that it's vulnerable to hacking, putting sensitive information from Arizona taxpayers at risk. How holes in our state system can affect you. Pope Francis is going to hold Mass in Juarez, Mexico next week. See how some Arizona Catholics are going to make their way to witness his appearance. And the most watched TV event of the year is this weekend. We take a look at the most popular Super Bowl food. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News. I'm Sydney Schofield. And I'm Lucas Robbins. Thanks for joining us. Tax season is around the corner and millions of Arizonans file every year and send their forms to be processed at the Arizona Department of Revenue, meaning the department is responsible for birth dates, social security numbers, and other sensitive taxpayer information. Cronkite News reporter Amber Kawaji talks about the 2015 state audit revealing vulnerabilities with the department's IT system. In September 2015, the Arizona Office of the Auditor General conducted an audit of the Arizona Department of Revenue. In the report were findings of a vulnerable IT system, software not fully up to date, and taxpayer information left out in plain sight. All of it part of an audit testing security by simulating common attack patterns. We were able to exploit a weakness to take over a, a large number of employees' user accounts. But we also found that department employees were susceptible to common hacking attacks, um, such as phony emails and phone calls, which is called phishing. Some of the IT issues include neglecting to scan IT systems for vulnerabilities. The audit found 85% of the systems had vulnerabilities, including not updating systems regularly. There's now kind of a hole in your system, right, that just exists. It would be like in your home, leaving a window open and unlocked. Right? By itself, it doesn't cause a problem. It's when a bad guy decides, sees that open window, and then decides to break into your house through that. And IT and software issues were not the only problems found. The audit also said one employee left a desk unattended for at least 20 minutes with taxpayers' personal and financial information in plain sight. Another employee failed to lock their computer screen, and yet another left desk drawers open, leaving sensitive information visible. I would say that for most of our recommendations, if not all of them, the department really just needed to formalize or, or develop and implement new policies and procedures. The Department of Revenue says in the report no security breaches have occurred and they are implementing the audit's recommendations. Cronkite News reached out to the Department of Revenue, but they declined to comment. Our IT expert says no IT system is immune to vulnerabilities. The fact that their systems aren't and their policies that they have in place aren't up to where they should be is definitely a problem and should be fixed. I can't say that professionally I'm shocked because I know this happens all over the place and a lot of organizations are vulnerable. Auditor Jeremy Weber says he is confident the department is improving their security practices. A follow-up to the audit and its recommendations for the Department of Revenue will begin in March. A report on the department's status will be available for the public. For more information, including the complete audit report, visit cronkitenews.azpbs.org. Arizona Republican Senator Jeff Dial has proposed SB 1416, which would effectively take a lot of the state take away a lot of the state superintendent's authority over the State Board of Education. Current schools chief Diane Douglas addressed her concerns with the bill this morning. Cronkite News reporter Ben Marjot was in the room for the testimony. It was a tense atmosphere inside the Senate Education Committee room this morning as the superintendent, Diane Douglas, went back and forth with the bill's sponsor and with the chairwoman over her authority over the State Board of Education. You can call evil good and good evil. You, I guess you can also call unlawful lawful if you, if you want to. Harsh words from the superintendent this morning after a lengthy and spirited debate in front of the Senate Education Committee. The bill in question, SB 1416, which would take away a lot of Douglas's powers over the State Board of Education. She argued it would turn her into a figurehead. Imagine how you would feel if someone introduced a bill that would make you a legislator in name only. Her testimony alone lasted over a half an hour and was filled with many tense exchanges like this. But where does it say that, ma'am? Where does it say it in the statutes that she's supposed to report to you? Douglas's main argument, that the Board of Education can't govern itself because it only meets for a few hours once a month. 
She said governing the board is her job, according to the state constitution. But Dial argued that that power was derived from state law. The state law currently under statute says the superintendent supervises these. So it sounds like there's been neglect on whoever's been the superintendent for years. The citizens of Arizona are entitled to know that every single employee who works for the state are properly supervised on an ongoing day-to-day -day basis to do the job that they're being paid to do. That's why it's tasked with the superintendent's office because we're the ones that are there to do it. Superintendent Douglas did not comment on whether or not she would go forward with a lawsuit if the bill were to pass in the legislature. Reporting at the Capitol, Ben Marjot, Cronkite News. There are two new bills being proposed in the Arizona House of Representatives, one of which would legalize the possession of legalize marijuana. Cronkite News reporter Nick Pope went to learn about the prospective laws. This year is, the, uh, is my system to regulate and tax marijuana throughout the state, um, so basically to make it legal. State Representative Mark Cardenas is pushing two bills in the House that would change Arizona's marijuana policies one of which, House Bill 2006, would make it legal to possess the drug if you were over the age of 21. 2006 is, uh, what, it, what it would do is that it creates a system of dispensaries throughout Arizona. The revenue from that would go towards drug treatment programs, uh, K through 12 education. Um, so it's things that we desperately need funding for and support for, which we don't uh, fund the legislature very well. Last year, there was about a billion dollars of sales in, mar in marijuana, and that all uh, happen in a legal market and away from a black market. They're showing increased revenue. I don't know that they're showing net gains just yet, and I don't know that they'll ever show net gains. You still have a thriving black market in places like Colorado. You're not going to be able to ever make up for the amount of damage that marijuana causes. Both sides will have to wait to see what will happen in the coming weeks of the Capitol. In Phoenix, Nick Pope, Cronkite News. HB 2007 is the other bill sponsored by Representative Cardenas. That bill would reduce the penalty of possession of one of less than one ounce to just a civil fine. If you're looking for more information on the marijuana debate, the Carnegie Knight News 21 initiative released a multimedia in-depth report on marijuana policy and attitudes nationwide. Reporters based here at Cronkite travel to states across the country to document how pot policies are taking shape. For full access, go to weedrush.news21.com. The Human Rights Campaign has released a ranking of states for how well they protect LGBTQ rights. Arizona is one of the many states that does not do well. We now go live to Cronkite News reporter Watha Shahid in our Washington, D.C. Bureau to learn about these rankings from the HRC. The report by the Human Rights Campaign looked at state laws that protect or don't protect gay rights at home and in the workplace, coming to the conclusion that there is still a long way to go. The gay rights movement has come a long way. But the cheers have faded because inequalities are still present. There is not explicit non-discrimination laws in place at the federal level, uh, and the majority of states don't have those protections at the state level um, either. Arizona is part of this majority. It's one of 28 states that is ranked in the lowest category in a human rights campaign report. The report ranked states on how protected their gay residents are from discrimination. What this report really demonstrates is there's so much more work to be done. But what does it mean to rank in the lowest category? It means the state lacks basic equality for gay people, like non-discrimination laws. The state of Arizona should really be focusing on uh, non-discrimination laws and ways that they can put in place that basic level of fairness. The HRC says these are negative laws in Arizona. Transgender exclusions in Medicaid, laws that restrict inclusion of LGBT topics in schools, and laws permitting discrimination in adoptions and foster placement. The HRC says these are positive laws in Arizona. Joint adoption, cyberbullying protection, and gender marker changes on IDs like birth certificates and driver's licenses. Despite the inequalities present, the HRC is optimistic. Our approach really has been to take a positive outlook. And what we want Arizona to walk away from uh, on this report is to say they should be making this a priority. 
This is the second year the Human Rights Campaign has released a national report tracking laws that affect gay rights. Last year, Arizona ranked in the lowest category as well. Live in Washington, I'm Wafa Shahid, Cronkite News. In our coverage of Black History Month, Cronkite News is asking our Public Insight Network sources to share their thoughts on two upcoming projects. The first project is a series about African Americans who have made a difference in their communities. We're asking viewers to nominate someone who's made an impact. The second project is to get a better understanding of the progression of race relations in Arizona. Do you think things have improved? To take part in these online surveys, look for our pin questionnaires at cronkinews.azpbs.org. A new bill looks to crack down on young drivers texting and driving. Coming up on Cronkite News. Teenage divers the potential real life consequences of distractions such as texting and driving. And with Pope Francis visiting Mexico next week, some Arizona Catholics are going on a journey across the border to see the pontiff. The true measure of all our actions is how long the good in them lasts. This is who I am, where I'm from. If you're on the right side of history, you can accomplish anything. It's a connection between your present and your past. Come this way. This is good. This is very good. We are attempting to fulfill the promise of America. The stories about who we are shape us. This chance to go through a time machine. Good heavenly day. We should know our history. It informs, but it doesn't constrict you. It's a framework to carry out human activity. Look around. The, grass is high. the sky is the limit. It started a long time ago. Looking for a fun and exciting way to support your favorite program on Arizona PBS? It's as easy as picking up your phone and texting friend to 77948 right now. One simple click and you are ready to make your safe and secure donation using PayPal or your credit card. No phone call needed and all of your donation will go to support your favorite program here on Arizona PBS. Don't delay. Text FRIEND to 77948 today. Pope Francis will travel to Mexico next week and anticipation is building. The Pope will hold mass in Juarez right on the border. Arizona Catholics are among those who want to be part of this historic moment. Cronkite News reporter Chloe Nordquist talked to the bishop in Phoenix about the importance of the Pope's border visit. The border is the best opportunity most Arizona Catholics will get to be near the Pope since John Paul II visited Phoenix in 1987. Catholics in this state will be among the thousands of faithful expected to make the trek to the border. It's been more than 25 years since a pope has visited the Southwest. Pope John Paul II knelt to pray here at St. Mary's Basilica in Phoenix. Now, Arizona Catholics are eagerly awaiting Pope Francis's trip to the border. I hope to meet with the Holy Father. The Bishop of the Phoenix Diocese is among those making the journey to Juarez, Mexico, where Pope Francis will no doubt talk about immigration. I'm sure he'll also be speaking about the barriers that cause such suffering uh, to the poor in so many parts of the world. Phoenix businessman Tommy Espinoza agrees the border location is significant. I think the real message is we really need to wrestle as U.S. citizens. We have to look at this issue of immigration. Espinoza spent a week with the Pope in Colombia, two months after Jorge Bergoglio became the first Latin American Pope. He is such a warm person. Uh, he truly is a Latino in the true sense of the word. In this picture, I was obviously honoring him as a Pope and kissing his ring. Espinoza is among the few Catholics who have seen two Popes in person. He was in Phoenix when John Paul II visited in 1987. While some will follow the Pope from Arizona, plenty of Catholics will be making a pilgrimage to the border. It's a very special event, and so I would uh, imagine that there's going to be a million people from different parts of the world that will be coming to visit the Holy Father. Catholics from at least three parishes in Phoenix are making a pilgrimage to the border or Mexico City to see the Pope. The pontiff arrives in Mex Mexico February 12th. 
In the Broadcast Center, Chloe Nordquist, Cronkite News. The Phoenix City Council wants voters to decide if a moment of silence should be held before council meetings instead of a traditional prayer. Three council members say they want the prayer issue on the city's election ballot. The council voted to get rid of spoken invocations yesterday in an attempt to prevent a group called the Satanic Temple from delivering the prayer before an upcoming meeting. For 20 years, the EB-5 visa program has allowed people from other countries to essentially buy an expedited visa. The program has been criticized as unfair, but Cronkite News reporter Katie Beery talked to one Arizona senator, senator who wants to mend it, not end it. Arizona Senator Jeff Flake has a new bill on the table. We need, uh, we need direct foreign investment. Uh, it helps us. Um, and this is just one program that we have that uh, can aid the economy. His plan is to reform the EB-5 Immigrant Investor Program. Well, we, we should mend it and not end it. Right now, the program allows foreign investors who create a certain number of jobs in the U.S. to get a visa faster than most people. But some say it's hard to track the original source of the money. Organized crime, terrorist groups, and the list goes on and on. But supporters point to the benefits of it. More than 100,000 jobs have been created since it started in 1993. Flake continued to argue that money from the program helps charter schools in Arizona. For one, I should say in Arizona, we're fortunate to have a number of charter schools that have been funded through the uh, EB-5 program. But uh, as has been mentioned, there are a number of reforms that, that need to be made. In Washington, Katie Beery, Cronkite News. A total of three Arizona charter schools have been funded by the program. They're located in Gilbert, Chandler, and Florence. Two new charter schools are under construction with money mostly from Chinese investors. A new bill is looking to prohibit teens from using their phones while driving. Cronkite News reporter Lauren Ashley spoke with a mother who knows firsthand the consequences of, of driving distracted. Eric was the most mindful um, person I've known, and just the opposite is what killed him. On July 25, 2009, 19-year-old Eric Okerblom was struck and killed while riding his bike. He was training to join UC Berkeley cycling team. Phone records later revealed the teenage driver was texting at the time. To, to lose someone that you love so much is something that's so incredibly preventable. Arizona House Bill 2241 will prohibit teenage drivers from using their phone except for an emergency. Alberto Gutierrez, director of Arizona Governor's Office of Highway Safety, says this bill is for everyone, not just teenagers. No cell phone use till you're 18 years old. But even then, after 18, you shouldn't use a cell phone while driving. So it's not only for teenagers, it's for everybody. Senator Andrew Sherwood sponsored the bill and says this is a public safety issue. We're not talking about just casually, you know, looking at something out of the window. I mean, you're talking about what you don't think is a long-term amount of um, distraction from the road is in fact a lot of ground covered in your car and it's dangerous. Okablam believes state lawmakers have the power to save their lives or the life of someone they love from distracted driving. Laws have to give a clear message. They have to give the message that no, you are endangering not only your own life, but everyone else out on the road. Orca Blom doesn't want another parent to go through what she has. In Phoenix, Lauren Ashley, Cronkite News. The bill is moved to the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. A hearing is expected within the next two weeks. Flying cars, robots, and dinosaurs, oh my. A new science exhibit is in town. Coming up on Cronkite News. See what pops with this coming attraction at the Arizona Science Center. When I was 12 years old, I was watching great performances on PBS. This program with Nureyev came on. Nureyev um, in a performance of Le Corsair, and I was amazed and awestruck. I really wanted to, to do it. I was street dancing at the time, and I never thought of formal dance until I saw great performances. I knew that I was really uh, a novice to dance, like high dance. I decided to check out the high school performing arts. And so one thing led to the next. 
Today, as a recognized dancer, I absolutely believe that when I saw the uh, performance, it affected me tremendously. And I know that's what happens when I teach. I'm opening an option for them that they hadn't seen before. Pop culture meets technology and brings the imaginary to life at the new exhibit at the Arizona Science Center. Cronkite News reporter Gilbert Cordova joins us live there. Gilbert? I'm going. Visitors who come here can see a robot, jetpack, virtual reality, and a new car, all under one roof. Welcome to Popnology. Okay, so a tough crowd. Let's be honest, that was not very exciting. What was once thought to be science fiction has started to become reality here at Popnology, a new exhibit at the Arizona Science Center that is looking to bring the past and future together. Visitors can see everything from realistic dinosaur eggs to dangerous robots. Chevy Humphrey, president and CEO of the Arizona Science Center, believes the exhibit has more to offer than just the wow factor. So Popnology brings together many of these ideas that we're trying to implement here at Arizona Science Center. And furthermore, its social component on the impact of technology has had on our society today. This new exhibit is home to four different sections. You might even find some familiar faces. Week, and there's only one way to celebrate it. Where you will find a car that was years ago only an idea. Local Motors is a technology company that designs, builds, and sells vehicles. And this car behind me is the world's first 3D printed car. The car became reality in 2014. Well, the next thing that Local Motors is going to do is we're on the path to launching a highway-ready 3D printed car coming out at the beginning of next year. And then in addition to that, because we can move so quickly with the iterations that we do on vehicles, you're going to see the first other forms of transportation. Starting this Sunday, Popnology will be open to the public until May 15th. For more in-depth look, check out the digital story at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. In downtown Phoenix, I'm Gilba Cordova, Cronkite News. The big game is this Sunday, and grocery stores and Americans are stocking up on guac. Coming up on Cronkite News, see how grocery stores are ordering a big supply to fill an even bigger demand. We are here tonight to explore tough issues. You've got to have people around you who aren't just laying rose petals in front of your way. And I kid you not, this is true. Trust is everything. This has been so much fun. It's about reaching people. There are more players on the world stage. The issues are more complex. We ask the questions that take us closer to the truth. What happened and what might happen. Because that's what we do. Would you like doing something like I do? I couldn't do this. I don't, I'm not qualified. I was thinking exactly the same thing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Charlie Rose. As part of the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at ASU, Arizona PBS is providing a state-of-the-art venue for the next generation of journalists. From newsrooms in Washington, Los Angeles, and here in Phoenix, Students engage in real-time, real-world news reporting, broadcast production, and online innovation. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS working together in new ways to bridge the classroom to the community in the digital age. Super Bowl fans are stocking up on avocados. Guacamole is now a game day tradition. As Cronkite news reporter Anthony Marroquin shows us, the appetite for avocados has never been bigger. It's Super Bowl week, and there's only one dip for your chip. A lot of avocados. Across the valley, grocery stores like Los Altos Ranch Market are stocking up. Oh, we sell a lot of guacamole here. That's because Super Bowl Sunday is the number one day for avocado consumption in the U.S. We'll sell 80 cases a day. That's double what they usually sell. Guacamole is quickly becoming a necessity at every single Super Bowl party. Americans are projected to eat about 140 million pounds of avocados this Super Bowl. That's enough to fill a football field end zone to end zone well over 46 times. 
Every customer is picking up an avocado daily. It's like they're eating it more in their meals. And Mexico is taking notice of that with a campaign that encourages people to eat more avocados from Mexico. For the second year in a row, it will air a commercial during the Super Bowl, and this time, it's out of this world. But most amazing of all are the avocados from Mexico. They're always in season, so you can enjoy them all year long. Oh, he can eat a whole one just right out of it with a spoon. He doesn't like to share. <laughs> like most families, the Gonzales will be enjoying the big game with a big bowl of guacamole, and maybe some whole ones for Dorian. In Phoenix, I'm Anthony Marroquin. Cronkite News. The amount of avocados Americans eat has doubled in the last decade and continues to grow each year. Cronkite News is proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. Here's what's coming up next on Arizona Horizon and the PBS NewsHour. On the next Arizona Horizon, hear from Clint Hickman, the new chair of the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, and we'll speak with a creative designer on how pop culture impacts technology. That's on the next Arizona Horizon. I'm Gwen Eiffel on the next news hour. After 50 years of war, Colombia faces a new fight against Zika. We sit down with Colombia's president. That's Thursday on the PBS News Hour. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.